I love baseball. Maybe it's the patriotic American in me, but I have some great childhood memories of picnics, baseball games, popcorn, and the musty smell of an old leather glove. With baseball season right around the corner, I'm hoping to offer that same experience to my family with our local St. Paul Saints and Minnesota Twins. But I'm not here to talk about baseball, although I guess if we get enough requests, we could do a future episode about baseball. Anyways, here we are, it's April, and it's time for some more hot topics. Coming up, we've got some CPR science, sedation management, and tips on writing a good patient narrative. So guess what? It's Regions EMS Update, and those are the three things you need to know. Hi, I'm Dr. Peterson with Regions EMS, and thanks for watching. Before we get into our topics for this month, I'd like to take a minute to brag about one of our colleagues. Many of you know Jennifer Smith, our education supervisor with Regions EMS. Jennifer does a lot of work behind the scenes to make sure our education team is successful, which includes doing a fair amount of teaching herself. Jennifer has been recognized by the National Association of EMTs as one of three people nationwide who are the 2018 EMS Advocates of the Year. Jennifer was recognized for her work on the Wisconsin EMS Association's Board of Directors and her work on advocating for EMS in the state of Wisconsin and at a federal level. Jennifer is going to be honored at a ceremony in Washington, D.C. on April 11th for EMS on the Hill Day. So congratulations, Jennifer, and thanks for all you do for EMS. One project that Jennifer has put a lot of time into was the training program for the Rescue CPR device. Let's talk about how this device works and why it's important for good patient care. Here's what you need to know. So I'm pretty sure we're all familiar with mechanical CPR devices, especially the Lucas device in our area. Many of us have had experiences where patients have become responsive because of the high quality CPR provided by these devices. Despite that, the large research studies done with mechanical CPR devices have shown no survival benefit over standard CPR. But thanks to the hard work of many of you in and around the Twin Cities about 15 years ago, there is a device, or rather devices, which have been proven to improve survival from cardiac arrest. Here's what you need to know. To understand how rescue CPR works, we'll use our demonstrator and first talk about how conventional manual CPR circulates blood. Here the red balloon is the heart and the blue balloons are the lungs. Each time we compress, we create a positive pressure inside the chest that pushes blood out of the heart and air out of the lungs. During decompression, the chest wall recoils and creates a vacuum that pulls some blood back into the heart and some air back into the lungs. This phase of CPR is crucial because the more blood that can be returned to the heart, the more blood that can then be circulated forward on the next compression. However, even with high quality CPR, we only circulate 25 to 40% of normal blood flow. As we can see here, the heart is not completely filling. One of the primary reasons blood flow is limited is because the patient's airway is open. This wipes out the vacuum we're relying on to fill the heart. Notice how the heart stops filling as soon as the air comes in. The rescue pod corrects this issue. It attaches to either face mask or advanced airway and regulates airflow into the chest. The rescue pod allows air to exit during the compression phase, but closes during the recoil phase. This significantly enhances the vacuum that we create during chest wall recoil and doubles the amount of blood pulled back to the heart. The rescue pump is a handheld suction cup device that actively lifts the chest to help further enhance the vacuum in the chest. By actively re-expanding the chest, it allows the creation of an even greater vacuum. 
and the rescue pod helps maintain that enhanced vacuum, resulting in near normal blood flow to the brain and vital organs. The key piece is the rescue pod, which selectively seals off the airway to allow the full pressure change inside the chest to be applied to the heart, rather than both the heart and the lungs. Add to that the vacuum created by actively decompressing the chest with the rescue pump, and you can move a lot of blood through that heart. So the difference between the Lucas device and the rescue pump is that the Lucas device only applies a three pound negative force to the chest wall, bringing it just back to neutral. With the rescue pump, we're targeting a negative 20 pound force, which brings the chest wall beyond neutral. The difference is significant enough to make the rescue pump, rescue pod combo the only FDA approved device that has been proven to improve survival after a cardiac arrest. There's still a place for the Lucas device when we have to move patients for various reasons, but I can guarantee you if it's me or my family member that's down, I can tell you which device I'd want you to use. So this segment is for the medics. Sorry BLS people, I just couldn't make this universal. Sometimes we do things to patients that aren't very comfortable. In fact, I would bet that when most people think of EMS, they think of some of those uncomfortable things, like shoving a tube down someone's throat, drilling a hole in their leg bone, or rubbing those paddles together to deliver several hundred joules of pure energy through someone's chest. But since all three of those things could be grounds for felony assault charges, we usually put on our compassion pants and keep our patients comfortable. Now most of the time you do a very good job with this, but every now and then I review a chart with some wonky sedation practices. That's right, I just said wonky. So let's talk about three simple rules you can use to avoid torturing your patients. These were taken from a blog post on the MD Aware blog run by an ER doc from Chicago named Seth Truger. To put this in context, how about you shove your finger down your throat and hold it there while we talk about sedation. First, for those of you who RSI, sedation is an RSI med. If you think of it this way, then you should draw up your post-intubation sedation meds at the same time you draw up your RSI meds. No one is happy when you're playing the let's catch up on sedation game with your patient because you weren't ready. Remember that you're also giving a paralytic when you RSI your patient and there's no way for you to know how long that paralytic is lasting or whether it's outlasting the induction medication. Which brings me to my second point. Paralysis is not sedation. Studies have shown that if you hear something three times in a row, you're more likely to remember it. Paralysis is not sedation. Paralysis is not sedation. Paralysis is not sedation. Paralytics like succinylcholine, rocuronium, and vecuronium are exactly what they claim to be, paralytics. These drugs render a person completely unable to move or react, but do nothing to their consciousness. Your patient will feel every touch, every poke, and every forced breath from that BVM, and they'll hear every word you're saying. There are very few situations where you truly need to give a long-acting paralytic such as vecuronium, but if you should find yourself in such a situation, it's absolutely imperative that vecuronium never be given by itself. You should always chase it with another sedative to make sure that your patient is comfortable and not just paralyzed. Which brings me to my third point. Pain is not a presser. First of all, the right thing to do is to just treat the pain. Secondly, if the pain-induced catecholamine surge is the only thing keeping up your patient's blood pressure, then you have a bigger issue you need to deal with. Treat the pain, then treat the other issue. Simple as that. No need to overthink it. Okay, you can take your finger out of your throat now. We recently produced a documentation CME video for those of you under the Regions EMS Medical Direction. I've received comments from some of you asking for more guidance on writing a good patient care narrative. Now there are several mnemonics you can use to structure your report, such as SOAP, Cheated, or iChart. Regardless of which template you go with, 
there are seven key elements that you should include in your narrative. The following tips were taken from Zoll's Pulse blog in case you want to look it up yourself. Here's what you need to know. Dispatch and response summary. The dispatch and response summary provides explicit details of where you were dispatched, what you were dispatched for, and on what priority. Included in this section is a short description of the response itself. Did you arrive without incident? Was there a change in response mode due to updated information? Scene summary. The scene summary details what happened when you arrived on scene. What did the scene look like? Where was the patient found? How was the patient found? What was your initial impression of the patient? This is often critical information for the hospital and you are the only person who can provide this information. HPI and physical exam. Here is where you would describe the patient's symptoms or injuries, the OPQRST elements, and your initial physical exam. This is a section that is often lacking based on my experience, probably because much of this information is captured by checkboxes in other parts of the PCR. You should really keep in mind that checkboxes are designed to make the data easier to analyze, but do a very poor job of communicating information to other healthcare providers. Even if you check all the right boxes, you still need to describe the HPI and physical exam in the narrative section. This paints a picture that helps with decisions later in the patient's care, whereas the checkboxes collect data points that can be used for quality assurance and reporting. Interventions. Under this section is where all interventions are listed. What did you do to or for the patient and why? This section should include vital signs that were assessed, whether or not you administered oxygen and why, was an IV started, what medications were given and why, etc., etc. Most PCR systems allow you to detail your interventions in a separate section of the PCR, so in the narrative, you should just highlight the critical interventions and provide justification. Status change. Was there any change in the patient's condition or a change in response to an intervention? If so, what was that change and what was done about it? In some situations, where there are significant changes to the patient's condition, you may need to re-document a physical exam, interventions, and status change. This would also be a place to document your second set of vital signs and a repeat pain assessment. Safety summary. The safety summary details a couple of different things. First, how was the patient transferred from the scene to the stretcher and then to the ambulance? Second, what safety measures were observed, such as safety straps while transferring the patient? You should also include what position the patient was transferred in and any other relevant information highlighting how you kept your patient safe during the transport. And finally, disposition. Where did you leave the patient and in what condition? If you did not transport, then you should include what the alternative plan was and what instructions were given to the patient. Good documentation is a skill that requires practice just like any other clinical procedure. I would encourage you to find a system that works for you and practice it every time you write a PCR. Good documentation is a very important part of patient care that is all too often overlooked. Well, hopefully something I said this month will be helpful for your practice. That'll do it for April. Fortunately, there's no new drug shortages to talk about. But looking ahead to next month, make sure to mark EMS week on your calendars, the week of May 20th. We're gonna have an EMS appreciation event that you're not gonna wanna miss. Special thanks to St. Paul Fire and the companies of Station One for hosting us this month and for their EMS committee's support and interest in our video updates. Since you're probably watching this on the internet, Go ahead and like us, follow us, subscribe to us, and email us some topics for future updates. From everyone at Regions EMS, I'm Dr. Peterson. Be smart, be safe, and be professional. Thanks for watching.